All right, family law. This is week four, our week four guide. And um, it's really hard for me to believe that I'm saying that because it seems like this semester is flying by. <clears throat> we are looking at legal recognition of non-marital families. And we've discussed this a little bit as far as why we're even bothering, why it's important. And some of you know, as a personal matter from your own lives, why it's important. We're gonna focus on the Hewitt versus Hewitt case that I'm assuming that you found. That's essentially your reading material um, for this week, for the first part of this week. And um, breaking that case down. And that's one of the things that you're supposed to have done before class. You know, telling me what the underlying facts are with Hewitt, what happened at the trial court level, because there's something that happened at the trial court level, and then what happened at the appellate court, and then what happened with the Supreme Court, and more importantly, why? What did the court say regarding someone seeking the protections in the process of the dissolution portion of the act without going through the um, the expectations of the act regarding marriage because the Hewitts weren't in fact married according to Illinois law as we now are familiar with it since we've covered that. <clears throat> and I want you to think about why the Supreme Court ruled as it did um, and later in the week, then you're going to find out or you're going to explore that a little deeper to make sure that that's still where we are with the law now. The, you know, we have to think about it as the pros and cons of non-married couples and the public policy reasons behind that ruling. And um, we can argue whether it's political or practical. Uh, I think obviously since the Hewitt case in 1978, 79, whatever it was, 79, um, you know, I was a freshman in high school. It was a long time ago. The world was a much different place. In the 1970s, um, in 72, my parents got a divorce. I was one of only two families or part of one of only two families, I believe, at my, you know, Catholic grade school that had parents who were divorced at the time. By the time my same class reached our senior year in high school, so that was 1982, if you want to date me um, as being old, I'm old. By 1982, 10 years later, over 50% of my high school class, um, their parents who had been married were no longer married, had been divorced just where society was. Fast forward, and you know we've since recognized, we tried uh, civil unions as a way to bridge acceptance of, of same-sex marriage, and now we just, anybody can be married within the realm or, or the limits that we now know because we already studied what it takes to be married. In any event, um, that's more the political part of it or the evolution, should we say, and we talk about how public policy or where we're at in history and how the social norms and all of that impact the law. So that's part of that discussion. Um, but I would suggest that you look at Hewitt as a more practical application, um, not as a political one. By that, I mean, um, the law has to have some way to determine what people's intent was. And the only real way to establish the intent of the things that we're going to talk about today and we're going to explore this week and then allow the courts to efficiently deal with those things to help people navigate and sort and sometimes make decisions for those people when they can't agree about those things is more of a practical one. It's just not practical unless you have some sort of parameters. So how do we treat non-marital couples who happen to come into our office? Well, first let's review why we may see those individuals. 
Um, we've discussed this a little bit, and some of you may know from practical experience um, and how you're dealing with things in your own lives. We see more non-marital couples, people who choose to live together within the same house, may share children together, property together, may look like, talk like, walk like, appear to be a marital family, but they're not married. And there's a lot of different reasons why people choose to do that or live that way. And, and um, I'm certainly not judging it. Um, but it's outside what we know as the norms. And it's definitely outside of what we know to be marriage or what's required of a marriage. And so the real concern there is what happens when those people, that couple, split. Um, so we need to review the law and how those individuals would be treated by the law regarding their, uh, their relationship. Um, and, you know, if there's children, their rights and responsibilities to those children and to an extent property. Property is a little more complicated. Children's pretty straightforward. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. So rights and liabilities, there may be consequences to cohabitation. Some of you sitting here listening to this know those consequences, you've dealt with them. I think I alluded to the fact that, um, you know, a few times a semester, a student, a former student, a graduate, somebody from the community, a staff or faculty member at ICC comes to me with related issues, issues related to cohabitation and um, a situation where they're no longer going to be cohabitating. And when I say cohabitating, I mean living with somebody in a romantic relationship, supportive relationship outside of, of marriage. Illinois doesn't recognize palimony. Um, so we have to be careful about the promises and the property transfers that people make. There are other legal theory, theories that some cohabitants um, will attempt to use to try to settle those issues. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But it does create issues more with property. One of the questions that always comes up is, did we do away with old laws that treated adultery and fornication as crimes? If you don't know what I'm talking about with adultery and fornication, this is a legal dictionary moment. So stop, pull out your dictionary, look for those words, adultery and fornication, and figure out what they mean. But there's still misdemeanors in Illinois. This is inconsistent with what we will review as Illinois divorce law since 2016 and the move away from the use of, of grounds of adultery um, as someone pursues a divorce. And prior to that, that was one of the grounds. There were 11 grounds and, and um, you could seek a divorce based on fault or you had to show you had irreconcilable differences and you lived separate and apart for a period of time, which typically wasn't feasible for most folks. So they usually filed under grounds, but we don't even do that anymore. Um, and the courts as a practical matter have always found it difficult to define what is open and notorious, um, you know, is required for adultery and fornication. My close to, you know, 40 years in law and justice, I don't recall anyone being prosecuted for adultery um, or fornication in Illinois. Could be, but I just don't, I don't recall that. So another question that comes up, when non-marital cohabitation ends, can a party sue the other for alimony or maintenance as we call it in Illinois? And the answer is no. California palimony case that grabbed headlines in the 70s 
involved Lee Marvin, an actor. Um, and he was sued by his non-marital companion of seven years, Michelle, who had actually taken his last name. And in California, the high court found that the parties made an actual oral contract, not a written contract, an oral contract, which could be enforced and that Michelle could recover money from Lee Marvin in accordance with the agreement that they made. So it wasn't even a written contract, an oral contract. After this week, and your reading and study and breaking down Hewitt, you should be well aware of Illinois' position on this topic. The other question that comes up, what happens if the cohabitating party buys real estate in co-ownership? Um, and that happens. And some of you may be part of one of those scenarios. It's treated like joined, uh, jointly owned property by any two people. And one of the parties can sue to have the property sold or the proceeds divided. And it comes down to as uh, the, for those of you in Will's Trust and States, if we've been reviewing, we just spent some time on real property last week. How is that property titled? How is it held? How is it held between those two people? Um, and so you can plan and you can do things to provide for, you know, that time that may come or may not come where the two people decide they don't want to live in the property together because typically it's going to be a residence that they own jointly, but it's treated just like if you bought property with anyone else, you weren't married to. And there's not a law that provides for it being treated any other way based on this cohabitation. Personal property, which those of you in Will's Trust in the States are even more familiar with because that's what we're covering or covered week three, right? Or is it week four? I don't remember, but we, we covered around right now, same time. Um, how do we divide that up? Well, there's no rules since the rules that apply to married couples don't apply to non-marital cohabitants. The logic of the situation is that each cohabitant should take away what they brought into the relationship and what they acquire together should be divided on a fair basis. I say, show your receipts, keep your receipts, have evidence of intent, be able to prove who bought what. Not unlike if you've ever been in a roommate situation where you and your roommate are living together um, and you're going to, you're going to split, you're going to go live in separate or different places for whatever reason, what some, most of the time it's life takes you there. Um, you know, we have an adult child that's this month had been living with someone, uh, a roommate, a friend for a few years now. Uh, they've acquired things together. You know, I'm sure they'll work that out. But if they couldn't work it out, where's your receipt? Who bought it? Whose was it? And you all know, you've had practical experience. You, you can see where that's going. Um, where a cohabitate Tating arrangement is in every aspect like a marriage, but it was not formalized by marriage. Divorce laws to, um, that apply to dissolution don't apply to that non-marital relationship. Divorce laws, except for child custody and child support, aren't going to apply, and they're not going to apply to the property division or the division of property or to any expectations that you might have regarding any other form of property like alimony as we discussed. Now when non-marital cohabitants have a child, you know, there's a presumption as we'll see when we get to that area of the law that if two people are married and there's a child born during the marriage, the father is the father of that child. There's this presumption that the law makes. When non-marital cohabitants have a child, would putting the father's name on the birth certificate with the father's approval prove that he is, as a matter of law, the father? Um, and the answer is no. 
They weren't married. The name on the birth certificate does not prove fraternity, although it may be um, some evidence of paternity, because why would somebody say, go ahead and put my name on the birth certificate if they're not, in fact, the father? Paternity may still be established by a court um, under the Parentage Act, and we'll cover that later in the semester. Um, so, again, you know, while if the child is, in fact, the child of the couple and they're not married, they're cohabitating, supporting and um, custody would come into play. That law doesn't have anything to do with being married or those laws don't have anything to do with being married. That doesn't necessarily prove that the person is the father. And so we may have to cover that or cross that bridge. Um, the other question that comes up, should non-marital couples have a written agreement establishing what their relationship will be and what will happen in the event that they break up? And I, my answer would be yes. And that's why we're talking about this. You may see these situations, but be careful with the agreement. And the agreement, I think, as you'll find out when you do your work for this week, will be best written if it's not referencing in any way the romantic relationship on the basis of any expectations of any relationship. Um, and it's more a, of a antiseptic, we're going to live together and share these property or these these things in property. And in the event that we choose not to live together anymore, this is how we agree to divide those things up. Um, essentially, you know, a prenup without the nut. I don't know that you'll see it that often, but you may see it. And you may be in a situation where you're thinking, you know, right now you could be sitting there, one of you could be sitting there and thinking, wow, I need one of them. I need that agreement. If a non-marital couple cohabitates for a number of years and then marries, um, in the event of divorce, the length of that non-marital cohabitation doesn't mean anything, okay? You don't get seniority rights. You don't get the benefit of those years. Marital property starts only after the marriage and the right to maintenance or alimony is measured in terms of the start of the marriage, not the start of the cohabitation. Um, <clears throat> the marriage does, however, legitimize any child born to the parties prior to the marriage or confirms those children, um, which again is kind of a non-issue most cases, but the important part is that, you know, you don't get seniority rights. You don't get time served for good behavior. <clears throat> so I've sort of talked about since 1979, but you're, you know, over this week or the rest of this week, you are going to extend that research and update your, your research on Hewitt to validate, shepherdize, look at any more recent cases and determine um, are there any unsimilar facts? Any with similar rulings? Where does Illinois stand on these issues today, 2021? And why? And do you see any change in reasoning? Anything that would suggest that we're moving towards recognizing cohabitation? And why and why not? The last thing I'll say is in this area, be cautious. Um, be cautious because the law covers marriage and it covers marriage pretty clearly. And in the next few weeks, we're going to see that up close as we move towards what happens when the marriage fails.
but this is a risky area if you get into this cohabitation arrangement because you don't have the ability to go to the court and say, under this statute, you have to provide me with this remedy. Um, you're kind of at the risk of whatever you've done and whatever documentation you have and whatever sort of agreement you may have that you can, or you know, essentially goodwill you can get from that other person. If there's a acrimonious, contentious split, which is just as likely in a cohabitation situation as it is in a marriage, um, just because you're not married doesn't mean that if you decide to split and you're in this romantic cohabitation arrangement, you can say, oh, well, you know, we weren't married, so let's just treat each other nicely and split everything up. Probably not going to work that way in my, um, you know, my own experience with human nature. But if it does great, most likely this is some area of the law that I would be telling you or anyone else and the people that will surely find their way to me this semester with some of these questions, be cautious. You know, um, it's a question that I, or the uh, advice I give when, and I, again, it comes up. I have students and former students who buy vehicles with their, you know, their significant other who's not their spouse, uh, real estate, um, gone into business with, all sorts of things. Not to mention just the, the normal buying the things you need to have in your house when you're sharing a house or sharing an apartment together to live. Okay, so there's cautions. And I guess that's how I'd end it, caution. This is your week four guide. We're one fourth away from the end of the, or into the semester, about halfway to spring break. It's crazy. Stay well. My, my uh, message in legal research was deep breaths. Inhale through your nose. Strong exhale through your mouth. Repeat. Get the oxygen to your brain. Slow down, stay organized, and stay on task. Get things done on time. But most of all, stay well.